Manx Radio Podcasts, powered by Shaw. Well, welcome to this week's Countryside with Kiri and Simon. And you've been talking to uh, one of the secretaries of the big agricultural shows. It's not that time of year yet. <laughs> not quite, mm. but a very important mm. time of year again. The Christmas Prime Stock Show is the absolute pinnacle of the beef and lamb industry. And it's uh, coming up and it's been held in the evening, which is a great idea. Yeah, and who's sort of in command? Yes, and this year it's ran by the Southern District Show and Sarah Comish has been in charge of getting the entries out and gathering them in and she says there's lots of young farmers going to take part this time. Yeah, young and old, and it's something that you've been to a few times, I would imagine. That's right, we always try and take yeah. part in it and with the new baby beef classes it's nice to bring the pedigree young stock there and you can take them home again without them going off to, to the butchers so it's a, it's a good platform to start them before the summer shows. Yeah, well you're not a fisherwoman, are you, in any shape or form in or around the coast or in the rivers and reservoirs no no i get called a fish woman on the yard though sometimes well, fair enough then well i went along to speak to karen galteris the inland fisheries manager at defa because the uh, it's come to the end of the river season and uh, it still fishes the reservoirs but of course uh, some people do like to keep fishing in the rivers by the sound of it so they just uh, tells us how we can keep an eye on things like that and also alistair breed the chief veterinary officer and Director of Animal Plant Health here on the Isle of Man. I spoke to him, well, getting on for a year ago, I suppose now, about measures they brought in about the BVD, the bovine uh, viral diarrhoea, and he, he tells me more uh, um, about that and the update of uh, what's been happening and how, how the numbers have uh, fared to a year ago. So here it is, all in this week's Countryside. Manx Radio's Countryside is brought to you by NFU Mutual. <laughs> Well, fishing around the Isle of Man has been uh, a great pastime for many years uh, around the coasts and the reservoirs and the rivers. Well, the river season has just finished and I went along to speak to Karen Galtras, who's the Inland Fisheries Manager at DEFA, to find out whether people can still fish at the moment, apart from the rivers. Yes, the reservoir fishing is open and stays open till the end of January. The bag limit's reduced on the reservoirs from November to January to two fish per day rather than four fish per day and you must use barbless or crimped hooks but the uh, the river fishing well finished at the end of September for brown trout and has finished all together now at the end of October the rivers won't be open again for fishing until the 1st of April to give the fish a decent chance to spawn and hopefully recruit more fish for the anglers and so forth and later on. Is that one of the main reasons the the seasons is it is it similar all parts of the UK and round about where the where the river season finishes or is the Isle of Man a little bit different where we want to keep stocks and things up? It's a little bit different here our season tends to open a little later than many other places because we don't tend to have that spring run of salmon that you get in waters across. We do get some big spring run salmon, but it, it uh, most of our salmon are what's known as, as grill save. They've been out to, to sea just for one winter. So they're coming back at a similar sort of size to the sea trout, most of them, although we do get some big official appear earlier in the year. I think it's an annual play. I think we spoke about it uh, before. And it's it's asking, again, for the public's help because you can't be everywhere. Is that the case? That's right. Yeah, th- this is the time of year because there aren't legitimate anglers out on the rivers at this time of year. And getting towards Christmas, there's always that risk of people poaching fish. We are out and about, out of office hours, including patrols at weekends and so forth, But uh, and we're assisted by uh, a small team of, of, of voluntary fishery watchers as well. But yes, we're, we're, we're the best will in the world. We can't be everywhere at once. And as with policing anything, um, in, intelligence and reports from the public, if anything's going on, are very important and useful to us, especially if they're very timely, especially if we, we're informed straight away if somebody sees something going on that they think might seem suspicious. If people are walking along, there are plenty of walks around the rivers of the Isle of Man. People are seen taking fish from the river at this time of year. Is that always illegal? Yes, absolutely, yes. The season is closed. Anybody fishing, using any technique, even rod and line, uh, would be fishing the rivers illegally at this time of year. So it's fairly cut and dried if you see somebody fishing the rivers or if you see you know suspicious signs suspicious equipment left along river banks or any signs of where nets might have been strung across a river just anything that doesn't look quite right do please report it to and, and obviously if you see something actually going on 
please don't hesitate to let us know. I appreciate that the very nature of this activity is such that you, you're probably not likely to see it during office hours and you may have trouble getting hold of fisheries. But the police themselves have always emphasised they take any sort of wildlife crime very seriously and they'll be more than happy to take a call any time of night if anybody sees something going on. They do have our contact details if they, they need to get us out as well and indeed they're, they're more than happy to pursue poachers as well themselves. Is it a big problem in the Isle of Man? Obviously couldn't see many poachers dangling a rod and line in the water. They're mm. most probably likely to use nets. It's always very difficult to gauge just how much of it is going on. We like to think that it's not as extensive as perhaps it once was but You don't, of course, need many people involved to actually have quite a big impact. You know, if a bunch of poachers pick a river just at the right time when the main salmon run's going on in that river, it can have a really big impact on the numbers of, you know, baby fish that come along the next year. And thereby, obviously, the numbers of fish, adult fish coming back from sea and return to the rivers a few years down the line. When you look at world problems with wildlife, endangered species and things like that. If this thing isn't sort of kept an eye on, there is, I suppose, in years to come, a worry that that could happen. Oh, absolutely, yes, absolutely. And um, certainly sometimes what what can potentially happen is that uh, a river might become pretty poor in terms of a, a salmon run if it's, if it's hit regularly by poachers. That might recover, and then all of a sudden you can get the problem started again as that incentive of a better population of fish to go after comes along. So it's something that I don't think we'll ever be able to be complacent about. We try to attack it from both ends, both obviously trying to deter or if necessary catch the activity actually happening and also emphasising to both the public and to you know, catering establishments and so forth the importance of not taking fish through the back door. So we, we've done a lot this last couple of years in, in sort of re-emphasising that message to businesses and so on of the importance of turning people away and indeed reporting to us if anybody tries to sell them fish that uh, they've no right to be selling to them. Indeed, it's not just illegal to sell salmon and sea trout caught in our rivers it's, it's illegal to buy them as well so whether you're selling on the black market or buying on the black market you're putting yourself in danger of quite a hefty fine and indeed potentially even a custodial sentence on the happiest side how has the season <laughs> been we've not had great reports in terms of in terms of the salmon run it's been the conditions for for fish running have been pretty good with sort of regular rainfalls and so forth some rivers are firming better than others. We've got some indication that the Laxey, the run in the Laxey River, for instance, may be particularly poor this year. And that would, um, if that's the case, it's difficult to know for sure, that would actually tie in with those catastrophic floods we had in December 2015. Because the, the salmon that were getting ready to smolt, to go out to sea, that is, in the following spring 2016 may well have been reduced badly in number by the big damage done to the river then. And they, because most of our salmon will come back after one winter at sea, a lot of the fish that would have been due to be running up that river now would be those fish. It's always difficult to tell for absolute certain. Other rivers seem to be not so bad. You get a very mixed picture sometimes, understandably, over what's going on. Last year, I know we had a lot of people thinking it was a very poor salmon run. At the same time, we got some catch returns in for anglers who reckoned they'd had a very good season and caught several salmon on only a few outings out onto the rivers. So very difficult to gauge. Um, We don't, unfortunately, have any cameras and fish counters set up on our rivers as yes, It's something I'd love to see happen one day in the future. But without that, it's very very difficult to tell from from year to year. Certainly the sea trout population seems to be in very good health. Certainly in several of our rivers I've got very good numbers of sea trout in them and and good numbers of very sizable sea trout as well. But reservoirs are there for them? Yes they are. River season won't open again until the 1st of April but yeah reservoir season is open until the end of January. It's a lower bag limit between November and January. It's only two fish per day rather than the four fish and you must use barbless or or crimped hooks as well. But although we don't stock the reservoirs November, December, January 
we've certainly had good reports of decent catches of of good quality fish in the reservoirs right through to the end of January this last couple of seasons, so they seem to be overwintering very well. Inland Fisheries Manager for DEFA, Karen Galtras. You haven't been dibbing your hooks in the rivers, have you? Nope, no. not this year. And if you see anyone doing it, um, then shouldn't be doing it, uh, Kiri, so... Um, just asking the public to to be vigilant about it but you know it's when they're trying to keep all the fish stocks up and you know keep the salmon stocks and and the fish around the island because you've seen what happened around the coastal waters when they've just dredged and dredged and took them all away isn't it it just shows monitoring it does work and adhering by these rules it makes it great for everybody in the future and and like you say keeps the stocks right and we can all enjoy it yeah do you ever get in the reservoirs for a fish No, I've never fished in a reservoir. No? No, never. Something I'd quite like to do, to be honest. Well, get your licence and get started. All right. (laughs) Well, you've been uh, not agricultural show season, but you caught up with uh, one of the secretaries, haven't you? That's right. It's a busy time again for the Southern District Agricultural Show in hosting the Christmas Prime Stock event. And I caught up with Sarah Comish to hear all about it. We alternate it uh, between the Royal Manx Agricultural Society and ourselves. So last year they hosted it and this year it's our turn. And it's a big undertaking because obviously the Prime Stock Show it has to be linked with the Isle of Man fat stock as well. That's right, yes. It is the Christmas Prime Stock and Carcass Show. So we run the Prime Stock Show on the Monday night at Nokalo Mart and then the animals will go to the plant and we hold the carcass show on the Friday. In recent years, there's been some changes to the classes. Uh, last year, the Royal Manx Show added in some baby beef section. Is this something you're going to look at continuing this year? Yeah, well, last year it was really successful. We've altered the whole format of the show. So rather than running it in the daytime, mm-hmm. we've found that it's a lot easier for people if we actually run it in the evenings. It's, and last year it worked really well for the Royal Manx. There were a lot of people attending in the evening. And we've got quite a few new exhibitors this year for this show which is great to see really and we're going to have quite a few young handlers and yes the baby beef section yeah with having the baby beef section it's ideal the cattle are a lot lot smaller physically it's easier for younger people to handle them will this be a bit more exciting and interesting for the young children want to take part i hope so yeah we're really working hard now to try and encourage a lot of the younger ones to join in and get involved with showing animals. So, yeah, I'm I'm really hopeful that we'll get a few more this year as well. And obviously you have the the sheep and pig section too, and with the new class in the sheep section, uh, just an everyday farmer can enter. It doesn't have to be of the typical carcass breeds like the Texel or the Beltex. This can be just a a general commercial lamb. Yeah, we've opened up the sheep section as well, so it's not quite so limited. And again, with the pigs as well, we've we've now got a non-commercial section. Yeah, so the small holdings could hopefully get involved as well it's the idea of rebranding it and you know putting new classes out there to drum new interest it must be quite difficult because agriculture is such a mainstay industry it's hard to keep reinventing it yeah i think the agricultural societies both we try and reflect what is going on in agriculture and try and adapt to suit that our job is to give people a platform to showcase their stock and that has traditionally always been what agricultural shows for Christmas ones and summer ones and times are changing so we're trying really hard to adapt to that to give people the chance that can still show their stock. And there's also a swing towards more traditional breeds, the native breeds and this I suppose will come out in the carcass side of it, people looking for um, better marbled beef Butchers seem to be looking for the more grass-fed, maybe not the most muscly cattle now. It'd be quite interesting to see what these what turns out from the live show to the dead show on the on the Friday evening. Yeah, I'm certainly no expert on carcasses. <laughs> but I have had a few um, a few lessons in the in the years I've been doing it on um certainly what what's changing trends-wise in in what the market demands. And I have been shown quite a bit now. I I know more than I did when I started, put it that way. (laughs) (laughs) But obviously the the Isle of Man meats have a certain category of carcass they need to have to to sell, to retail. This reflects back on your weight bands at the actual live part of the show. It does, yes. We do need to stay within the constraints that the meat plant have, that they have to fit the market that they're selling to. So, yeah, we do we do have to constrain the weights that way. 
we did have a bit of a laugh. We decided we might have an overweight class. We decided, <laughs> we decided we've got to make sure that people know it's the animal and not the handler. <laughs> But these classes are well supported with great sponsors as well coming on board. Yeah, we do have some very good local sponsorship. I'm not going to list everyone now because in case I miss anyone, but we do. There's a, a lot of the local agricultural suppliers support us and some of the UK feed company support us as well. So yeah, we can offer you some good prizes. And also with it being in the evening time, a lot more people can be in attendance, but there's a hot food and, and snacks put on too. Yeah, the judging starts at six o'clock on the Monday evening and there will be catering available. And we always offer a cup of tea or a coffee and some biscuits to people as well. So more than welcome to come into the office and get a nice cup of tea. This show, Sarah, the Christmas Prime Stock Show, is a prestigious event. It's one of those shows that you've worked all year round to produce the best quality beef. And the farmers entering this competition will produce some quality livestock. Yeah, definitely. It's probably, publicly, it's less well known, but... If you're within the industry, yeah, everybody knows about it. And like I say, because the format has changed and we're holding it in the evening, we're hoping again to get really good attendance because last year it was really successful. Loads of people came along to watch. But it's not just for agricultural people. It'll be a great way for housewives to come and actually see what beef is on offer and, and lamb, you know. And then obviously if they if they can take part in actually going to see the them dressed in in the Isle of Man meats building itself. Yeah, I mean, it is a show that is open to absolutely everybody to come along and have a look. It's not exclusive to farming. It's great for people outside of that to come along and have a look as well. That was Sarah Comish, the secretary of the Southern District Agricultural Show. It's uh, getting to quite a popular and, and quite a big event, that, isn't it? That's right. Movement to the evening yeah. has certainly helped, gets the general public involved. And it's easy for people that have a day job as well. They can still get home and get the cattle and sheep prepared and bring them down. And, and for the children after school as well yeah and all the the years that i've been involved in in covering the shows and being to the agricultural shows whether it be the royal manx or the southern one they've they've really got good teams and good secretaries haven't they they're lucky they really have for the summer shows it takes a full year to get it all up tip top ready for them two days and it's the same with the prime stock show they've worked really hard to keep bringing out new classes and you know some years might not be as popular as other years but to get the young ones involved is hopefully ready in it for the future as well yeah and they'll be the ones that uh, maybe picking up the rose balls at the this things in it. a few years won't they <laughs> Manx Radio's Countryside is brought to you by NFU Mutual. Well, Alistair Breed is the Chief Veterinary Officer and Director of Animal and Plant Health at DEFA here on the Isle of Man. Well, quite a number of months ago, I spoke to him about BVD, which is bovine viral diarrhoea. I asked him, was there any development in it here on the island? At that time, we were talking about bringing in powers to make it available to cattle keepers where there were cattle that were infected with this disease. Pleased to say that has happened. The um, rules are now in force. Cattle keepers now can find out where infected animals are and so reduce their risks of buying infection in. It was worrying that people weren't sort of admitting that maybe they had a problem with it, wasn't it? It was posing a risk uh, to other cattle keepers. There was a certain amount of misunderstanding out there in the countryside. So by making it available, this information available, it has actually allowed people to assess what the risks are and take suitable steps to actually avoid them. So it's taken the element of guesswork out of it. Yeah, but there was quite a few cases last year, new ones in the island, and, and I think this uh, scheme that you've brought in has managed to reduce that though, hasn't it? The number of cases of BVD has been falling over the years and it was reached a high of about uh, 77 cases back in 2015 and the total has been dropping since then. So far we're down to 28 in the current year but the year is not yet over and we have time lags with reporting of results. But the reason I'm sitting here talking today is we have just launched a consultation on further steps we are considering taking in relation to BVD because while the levels are dropping, there is still some of it about and more concerningly, it is still cropping up on new farms and we need to stop the spread of it. Is this coming through imports or is it getting transferred locally? The bulk of this is basically a local infection, we believe, right. although as you point out, we can potentially import the disease. We have some steps in place to try and 
reduce the risks of that. But one of the things we are consulting on is having further controls on imported animals to reduce that risk further. So in a nutshell, what we uh, want to do is to reduce the level of infection in the national herd further by removing these very infectious animals, these so-called persistently infected animals, or PIs. We also want to reduce the risk of spreading the disease around the island further by having additional restrictions on the movement of cattle and uh, increased biosecurity measures. Really, it's quite a long list of questions we're we're asking people to to comment on because we need a lot of controls to really have a chance to uh, stamp this disease out. And we'll be asking people to comment about what further controls they would like to see on importing cattle as we said, and really the last thing is how we can improve the value of the testing we're doing at the moment. Cattle keepers are required to test all their calves that are born for the disease, but due to the complexities of the disease, an animal can either have a temporary infection or a permanent infection, and one of the things we are looking to do is to require retesting of animals which test positive to find out if they're transiently infected or permanently infected. And the reason for doing that is because permanently infected animals pose a much, much greater risk of passing infection on to other animals. And it's generally accepted that if we can get rid of all the persistently infected animals, the infection will die out. So maybe a little bit of the time now that farmers or or cattle owners are going to take to to give some information over will far outweigh the paperwork and consequences if they contract that sort of disease onto their herds? They will indeed, and I do appreciate it. It's quite a long questionnaire on the government website, but it is, honestly, it's very easy to fill out. There are lots of yes-no questions and boxes for people to put in their comments, which we're very interested to hear. But I would hope people see it as in their best interest because the control methods we use will affect them. And as you so rightly say, this is a very expensive disease if you do get it in your herd. There's the effects you can see with, you get persistent infected animals, which will get a a condition called mucosal disease, and they basically get very, very grotty and run down. But really, the vast majority of the costs that you incur are not from those animals. It's the effect it has on other animals which have short-term infections, and also that makes them far more susceptible to get other infections, especially pneumonias and scours. And it is quite remarkable how some farms that have managed to get rid of it from their farm have commented that the number of scouring calves and the calves with pneumonia has dropped away completely. So that's really good on an animal welfare basis and it's also good on a money basis because obviously sick animals are expensive to treat. I mean we've got this system now where you can check if you're buying animals. Is there a similar thing if you if you're buying them in from the UK or anywhere like that, can you trace it back there? There are some systems in, in the UK. They're not joined up at the moment. Scotland has a system for the whole of Scotland, which is, is quite useful. But in uh, certainly in the other, the other parts of the United Kingdom, the, the system has not really reached that level of integration just yet. But there's no reason why people cannot ask the person they're buying the animals from what their health history is and if they've done any testing and if they vaccinate their animals. So there's a lot they can do to help themselves on that front. Not quite going to get to the stage, you know, one, somewhere around then, when the foot and mouth was all around, not on the Isle of Man, thankfully, touch wood, but there was quite draconian measures to keep it away from here, which which did the job. We won't get to that stage, will we? No, and I can uh, assure you and and your listeners, uh, no, bovine viral diarrhoea is not a pleasant disease, but it is not in the same league, it is not the same threat that uh, foot and mouth disease is. It is spread in different ways and it's a much more of a slow burn type disease. So no, don't get anxious, it's not on a foot and mouth disease scale, that's not an issue. However, we do need some increased biosecurity measures including movement controls. And how, how would you do that? This is what we're consulting about. At the moment, People are not allowed to move infected animals. And one of the things we're asking for is whether people think we should require the killing of these persistently infected animals because they pose a risk not only to the farm they're on, 
but also to their neighbours who have an increased risk of getting disease, and further afield because contaminated excrements and fluids from these animals can spread the disease quite effectively to other animals, whether it's just on Wellington boots or whether it's on clothing or equipment. It'd be sad if it had to get to that stage, wouldn't it? And the fact is that it still could be imported back, even if you eradicated all the ones who were affected on the island. People could still bring it in by not really following the rules and you'd be back to square one and culling needlessly, I suppose. Persistently infected animals are little virus (coughs) factories and are great sources of infection, sadly, and are tremendously infectious. Obviously, if we make rules, we'd very much hope that people see it in their best interest to comply with those. When those rules are in law, obviously there are penalties available if they don't comply with them. But you're absolutely right, we need several prongs to this strategy. We need to basically stop the spread of the disease on the island eradicate the disease on the island and along with that as you so correctly say is prevent the re-importation of the disease from across the water and we do have testing of animals which come in now we have testing after they've come in and we are asking people if they're prepared to have their animals tested before they come in before they're imported and also other additional controls such as keeping the animals in for quarantine for longer after they've brought them in so if they've got a transient infection the risk of them spreading that is very low and also that if they bring in any pregnant animals they carve those animals in isolation so in case the animal itself the dam is not infected but the calf is that the risk from that will be basically uh, neutralized by the the quarantine processes but you're absolutely right there's there is that strand we don't want to bring it in because it it would start up all over again and if people want more information in detail about this or any questions about it they can go online or contact yourselves that's right we've got lots of information on our uh, the department uh, website also if people wish to discuss with their private veterinary surgeons what the risk factors in relation to their own specific herd is that would be very very useful for them in general terms i'm available if people want to speak to me on that front uh, they can ring uh, 685844 there is a lot of information a background a lot of background information as part of the consultation which is available through the government website if you click on the links for consultations it will take you to there and there are links giving you background information and there's information around the questions embedded in the questions explaining why we're asking the question and what we're trying to find out. Alistair Breed, the Chief Veterinary Officer and Director of Animal and Plant Health here on the Isle of Man. And you can find uh, more information out by contacting DEFA uh, at St John's and uh, you can even request the hard copy of the forms necessary. Important part of uh, the cattle rearing and keeping here in the Isle of Man and buying and selling though, Kiri, isn't it? Um, the more information that's available bound to help. Oh, definitely. The health status of some of the cattle in the Isle of Man is absolutely tip-top. And DEFA doing a great job with the BVD tag system has really paid off. Obviously, the results are, are progressing in the right direction. Mm. Manx Radio's Countryside is brought to you by NFU Mutual. Well, it's important that we look after the stock. And, of course, Alistair Breed talking about, uh, mainly, of course, the, the beef side of the, the cattle here on the Isle of Man, uh, about particularly the BVD Um, situation and just asking for a bit of the farmer's time I suppose which is something that you know will benefit in the future like you were saying. Well that's right having these diseases in your herd is uh, detrimental and it causes so many problems ill thrift and everything else that goes with it so monitoring it and keeping it out of the herds is pretty much essential for good business. Yeah and you can still fish in the reservoirs as Karen said there but no fishing in the rivers when you're in trouble (laughs) (laughs) or using nets or anything like that because people do go to to quite extreme um measures to to get the the salmon which obviously uh, they can try and sell in the restaurants and things here which is illegal as well like she was saying there if you buy them no and so and wow. things like that yeah and uh, of course the prime stock show Yes, it's going to be a busy time for farmers getting their cattle doled up ready for the end of the month. But uh, if you've got time, go along and enjoy it. Yes. All right, we'll leave it there for this week's Countryside. We'll see you at the same time next week. So from me, Simon Clark. And me, Kerry Gomez. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Don't sit in the slow lane. Join the fast lane right now with Shaw's all-new Superfast Plus Broadband. Enjoy more bandwidth, amazing speeds and the best value on the island from just £23.95 per month. So don't be left behind. Get a piece of the high-speed action with Superfast Plus Broadband from Shaw. 
For details, visit our stores in Douglas, Ramsey and Port Erin or click shore.com. Love the Terms and conditions apply.